Um, my name is Maura Connolly, I'm a uh, consultant psychiatrist and I work uh, on a part-time basis with the Mental Health Commission and I'm joined with my colleague Paul John, who has a background in social work. We're going to speak to you about the case of AB, which was published in August 2023. And we'll start again, if you like, with acknowledgement and thanks. And that's acknowledgement um, of the work that was done for this, this person and the staff who did work hard with this person and also to acknowledge that the staff um, were incredibly generous and helpful when came to this review and approached it with the same tag that we have which is what learning can be gained by a detailed review of a single case um, and obviously I want to acknowledge and give thanks to the family who took the same, the same approach. Just by way of background, um, that's the case, uh, I would urge you to read it, it's quite lengthy, there's a lot of detail in it, we will skim through that today and pull out what's relevant for today's, um, for today's conference. Just to set it in, in, in the setting, the work done by the Mental Welfare Commission is that um, ideally the, the, our, our purpose here was about protecting human rights of an individual and we're focused on a very vulnerable individual and in terms of activity what the Mental Welfare Commission does, this, this sits under the investigations and casework element, so that's the, the history to it. A bit, more in, a bit more history is that actually this came from an additional piece of work where um, there was a review of arrangements for investigating deaths of patients who, you know, who died whilst being treated for mental disorder and one of the recommendations was that the Mental Welfare Commission um, uh, it, investigate or come up with solutions for a better <coughs> system of review. Um, that work has been done or a proposal has been sent to the Scottish Government and along the way there were certain cases chosen and this case was was chosen in that uh, from that piece of work. So we had identified 23 cases of people who died while detained and had a, uh, a diagnosis of learning disability. We were interested in that group and this case spoke to us in many ways as being relevant to review. AB died in acute general hospital a day after the detention was lifted. There was no local review. Um, the case, there have been calls to the Commission over the years for advice and advice was offered. Calls came from different individuals, different professionals, different questions. So there was an ongoing kind of uh, approach um, for advice on this case. Um, we in our review, I decided to focus on the use of ASP and that, of course, is the theme today. We'll draw that out. We looked at problems with the guardianship application on the adults with incapacity and we looked at the Mental Health Act as it was applied and the focus on human rights around that in that there is an obligation to protect people who are detained um, and that has to come through in clinical approaches. Um, a key thing is about disseminating learning and that's what we're about today. But this case gets to the heart of the balance to respect privacy and right to choose versus the duty to safeguard and protect or obligations to protect people who are detained. So a bit about the story of AB and CD and XY. So AB um, was detained in a... a, a they, I think I might have skipped one, have I? I won't, yeah. Yeah, so the learned disability, yeah, the same learning. Fine, okay. So they were detained under the. Uh, sorry, these are in the wrong order. No, no, I've got one missing. Okay. So AB was a person with mild or moderate learned disability, long term medical condition requiring self management. Um, they were estranged from their family since the 1990s um, and they disappeared with CD off to another part of the country with a new identity. The friendship initially had been welcomed by the family until CD falsely alleged that the family had assaulted AB. The family managed to locate AB via a church contact and raised concern locally via an intermediary and that led to the first ASP intervention. That ASP intervention um, concluded that yes, AB was an, a vulnerable adult but didn't answer whether they were unable to safeguard themselves or at risk of harm, but no further action was taken. So our view was that it was somewhat flawed there. 
Then was the death of XY, a different individual, um, and this then led to a second ASP intervention for AB. The reason being that the second individual was linked to CD, and CD reported to be, at times, their carer, their relative. Um, and so it was right to reopen the look at a, a second look at AB, at which point it was concluded that AB was a vulnerable adult who might be unable to safeguard themselves and was at risk of harm. And from about here on, um, a, a, a solicitor objected to much of what social work were doing. Almost every step taken was objected to, complaints were raised, and detentions were challenged. So that, that can sort of happen as we, as we move on. So sorry, from this slide then, the, having determined that AB uh, was a vulnerable adult uh, and at risk of harm, the, um, there were attempts made to, um, to, to look at this person in a in place of safety, but that failed. So they were uh, detained under the Mental Health Act short-term detention into an inpatient LD unit because it was warranted to assess for the actual diagnosis and whilst there to look at physical health, the relationship with CD, capacity to consent for treatment, and to try and see AB on their own because it's very difficult to do that within the community setting. The conclusion was a guardianship application was warranted, but that faltered. Now I said there was a systems failure, that was because there were problems in getting a second medical opinion, but also the team acknowledged that engagement seemed to improve at that point, and that was another reason which was given to step back from actually completing the guardianship application. You might want to think about that or discuss that. Um, one of the issues was, is there a flight risk? Um, and so that formal approach was then replaced by care programming, which you will all know about care programming, but that failed again because AB and CD didn't participate in any way in the care programming approach, and eventually the case was closed um, to social work after you know, some feedback with um, primary care, nursing and so forth. So move on a year uh, and in November 18, uh, AB was admitted with a, a serious fracture having fallen on stairs in their, fl at their flat which was already deemed unsuitable by housing but they had refused attempts to actually improve upon this. Um, Post-op treatment and rehabilitation from November right through to February 19, so a three-month period, was repeatedly evaded or refused or obstructed or interfered with, and much of that was driven by CD. So the, the impact of CB, CD, I have a plus minus there because at times CD was the key to actually relating to AB, getting AB to eat, getting AB to drink, and so forth. Um, so staff were always trying to marry these, these, these needs. There was an, a short-term detention certificate and a CTO and specific persons, uh, specified persons, sorry, was brought to bear as well. Um, although it was brought to bear, it wasn't well implemented. The third ASP intervention resulted in the interim guardianship application by, at that stage, the family. But this happened within days of, of AB's death. Um, so that's the story. Factors to, to just remind ourselves of are there was long-standing poor management of a long-term condition, more than one long-term condition, physical health condition, I have to say, but management of that was poor. Um, to the, for example, no outpatient tenancies for four to five years in a row, not turning up for um, uh, you know, routine primary care screening for various things. Um, access to assessment and care was repeatedly thwarted by CD across all settings, community, inpatient, detention, you know, acute physical care, mental health care. The solicitor repeatedly objected and although staff were confident that they didn't let that get in the way, time had to be given to the actions of this, of this solicitor um, who gave voice to um, AB and CD's views to reject input. So AB assigned power of attorney to CD, and we raised a concern about the actual capacity for them to do that, um, although that's not the you know, primary thing to discuss today. So the latter stage, 
CD did interfere with AB's treatment in the acute rehab wards, and I think we can overtly say they harmed. Uh, we describe all the behaviours in, in the report. Um, all of these various acts were used and called upon. Eventually, in, in the last sort of ASP meeting at which police were present, CD was arrested and charged, uh, but those charges were dropped due to lack of criminal intent, um, and AB died. The criminal intent aspect is, a, is quite a high bar. Um, but ordinarily, just to remind ourselves, that combination of fracture and fall, long-term conditions, one or more, shouldn't lead to death within three months in a hospital setting. Highly unexpected, really. So there was a chaotic few weeks when, I guess, attempts were repeatedly made, lots of discussions, lots of input, lots of care. <coughs> the protections weren't fully realised or fully uh, enacted. I'm going to stop at this point and hand you to my colleague Paula, who uh, will take you through the, the, the more analytical aspect of this case. Um, thank you, Paula. <laughs> Thanks, Moira. Um, as Moira has highlighted, this is a very complex case, and there are lots and lots of issues and, and lots of determination and findings, which, as, as she said, are contained in the report. Um, we're just going to look at some of them today, and um, in line with our next speaker, we're going to uh, focus a little bit on musings about the concept of undue pressure or the nature of this relationship between A, B and C, D. So first of all, in terms of right risks and legal safeguards, we were very keen to look at the interplay of three pieces of the legislation which we pulled out in the report. Um, and we have come down quite clearly in saying that we think welfare guardianship would have made some difference um, to, to you know, potentially the longer term outcomes for AB. Um, and that didn't happen, as, as we've heard, for both kind of some reflective elements from the professionals involved, but also kind of systemic issues in relation to obtaining second medicals, which were very difficult at that time. There was very clear non-engagement um, by both AB and CD, and you know, in lots of ways, our hearts go out to the professionals because there was very, they were very hostile, they were very aggressive, contacts were extremely difficult, um, there was lots of verbal abuse, um, and not on both sides, but from from CD in particular. Um, and we've kind of knew subsequently that, this, that there was this kind of non-disguised non uh, uh, compliance factor which we see quite a lot in, in child protection in which there's been you know, quite a bit of, of uh, musing and research about. We found less of that in the adult um, support protection framework, but I mean it undoubtedly um, followed a path of um, being very resistant to input from professionals, having very short windows of cooperation, which then made professionals rethink and think, well, we've got a positive inroad, things are improving, we'll take a different tack. And I think that moving away from that longer view decision-making and longer-term assessment of risk, um, really, and bear in mind the Commission looking at this down the lanes and in hindsight, really kind of sometimes set people off on, on, on a different way of thinking. The second capacity assessment for the guardianship application obviously we, we talked about and we have been advised by our own solicitors at the Commission that this, um, because the Act places a duty on local authorities and says that it must apply, there seems to be a decision where the local authority here had, had made that decision Kind of, we couldn't find a sort of formal process to where they had backtracked on that or where that decision had been taken formally. It just seems to sort of tail off. They did, as I say, see some progress. I think, I think the fact that they couldn't get a medical really contributed to, the, to that process. But also, again, there had been some short-term positive engagement from A, B and C, D. And they thought, well, if things are improving, maybe we don't need that guardianship order after all. Um, the power of attorney appointment was challengeable. There are various uh, sections that can take place within, or various courses of actions that uh, could have been looked at, including contact with OPG, 
and ourselves visit the duty under section 10 to investigate if there were you know if there were any concerns about AP, AP's capacity to grant um, a welfare power of attorney in particular. Um, and there's also section three, section ten and section twenty of AWR AWR that, that, that could have been considered. Um, we also did highlight um, that services could have looked um, with more detail in relation to the concept of undue pressure. Um, and I'm just going to pause um, a couple of um, issues around the nature of the relationship, um, which, which might have led to that. It isn't that services didn't discuss this issue in case conferences, conferences but actually it was kind of mooted it was mentioned and then folk moved on. There was no kind of reflection about where do we go with that, what do we do with that, how do we achieve that in a court setting, and hopefully that's something that then we'll address in the next, uh, the next presentation. Um, so for example, AB met CD while she was still living with her family in her local area. She moved in with CD um, and from the moment that happened, the family very much used the term brainwashing to us. Um, the, they felt that CD actively turned AB against the family, and they created distance by moving um, quite significantly far away from the family home. Um, lost all contact, really for a period of about 20 plus years. They, uh, she did not see her family again until the day before she died. Um, the, they both created um, a history for themselves in relation to um, circumstances that just weren't accurate. So there was talk about AB having gone to college and studied and been in employment. And uh, from what professionals were saying to us, that, that seemed very much fabricated. There was no kind of evidence that anyone could find to support this past history. Um, and there seemed to be a sort of legacy of history that CD very much kind of added to. AB changed uh, their name to that of CD. In fact, it was changed to one of CD's deceased siblings, um, which was quite an odd thing we felt. So it was that she took the name of a deceased sibling of CD and um, they described themselves as having a sibling relationship, even though there was absolutely, obviously no blood relation to them at all. AB changed their physical appearance, so the hairstyle was similar, the clothing was similar. Um, they were very much identified in their local community as, as, as being a unit and being together and never being apart. Um, CD <coughs> quite clearly stated to professionals that she uh, she was a carer for AB and that actually um, everything should be deferred to, uh, to her in, in relation to health and welfare matters. As we've said, she was granted power of attorney, um, which kind of added to the complexity and made decision making and controlled decision making um, and in, in rules for professionals very, very difficult. Um, and CD would as well as highlighted, would very much direct decision making for AB, often speak on their behalf, um, say, no, don't take that treatment, no, you don't want to be taking that medicine, no, don't do what they tell you, you don't want to be seeing them. And it really, really severely compromised um, physical health care in particular, which did ultimately lead to death. Um, there was um, a background history in relation to XY. Um, um, where CD had a relationship and also called us, um, themselves a carer with another adult. And we felt that some of the learning from that case had not been brought forward into the situation relating to AB. Um, there was a view held by um, some professionals within the multidisciplinary team, and it was very multidisciplinary, that actually this was a positive relationship. Um, you know, so there were lots of debates and lots of reflections about, but if we split them up, what will that mean? What will that, what will that do for them? How, what, what will the impact be? Um, I need to finish up, so I'm going to cut this very, very short. 
Um, and that did change things quite problematically, um, I think. You can see where that was coming from, but ultimately it was a, it was a harmful relationship. There were question marks about undue pressure bearing and whether you know, there, there was coercive control. Um, lastly, um, I will maybe, maybe talk about this in questions, but just, just to reiterate um, Moira's point about that AB was somebody who was detained um, under the Mental Health Act and that there are significant rights-based considerations and obligations when someone is detained to look into um, their welfare and, their, and the rights that they, they should be afforded. So the last two slides can just cover those bits of information, so I've got to fly through those. Um, but we can share those with you if anyone's interested. But that was something as a commission that we were keen to look at, and particularly as she had been detained before her death. So with that very whistle-stop tour, I'll pass you on today. <laughs>